And the bottom line that Mary Pence frequently says is there really isn't any other alternative for her, for me, for Jim, for so many of us on this Zoom. There's just inaction is just not an option. It's not an option for people who care about the country, but it's also just not an option psychologically. Like we just can't do nothing <laughs> because we would go insane. So um, today I think is gonna be a really interesting meeting. It's going to be a pivot meeting, analyzing what has just happened and then talking a bit about where we're headed. We are not going to have a monthly meeting in December but we will pick it up again in 2022. And I'm anticipating we will have sort of a different kind of energy in 2022 because um, that is just going to be an incredibly important year in so many places. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Great, and I see I'm not on mute, so that's good. I think I know almost everybody, but for folks who might not know, I'm kind of the political an analyst for the group. And in keeping with what Lisa said, I tell you, I've been doing a lot of thinking and a lot of reaching out and a lot of um, analyzing and so forth. And as a result, I got a lot of slides. So, so bear with me a, a little bit, um, if you will, on that. And I will move to sharing my screen, hopefully. Everybody see it? Yep. yep. Okay. So um, who knows what this is? The wake up call. So the fact that you are on this call means you are awakened, not necessarily woke, but definitely awakened. And um, I'm really glad about that because that's the way we have to look at it. While I'm thinking about it though, is one thing that you can do uh, is reach out to other people. Uh, and I know, for example, Corey is really good at that. So I, I, I think the, um, it, that the way we're going to be able to become more effective is to, you know, continue to reach out to other folks. All right. And another metaphor. And the metaphor of the hot air balloon, somebody once, um, her, I heard this, said a lot of times campaigns are like this. You know, there are things you can do. Like if you were, you know, you were trying to do a, a hot air balloon, you can, you know, pull on the ropes and try and go one direction and you can try to increase the heat and go higher and get a different wind. But by and large, the main determinant is the way the wind is blowing. And I think we did a lot of good things in Virginia, but I think uh, without making it sounds like too much of an excuse, uh, the wind was uh, blowing uh, against us. And for, for, for analysis that you, many of you, I'm sure it's all I've probably pretty much seen. Okay, now I'm also gonna start out with the bottom line. Uh, and I've said some of this before and it's very general. It doesn't necessarily just reflect um, um, Virginia, but I see at least five major problems with the way Democrats approach elections. And they are, being tied to this election cycle, uh, the election cycles, boom and bust, which is very inefficient and very uh, ineffective. Uh, the many individual siloed campaigns, I never kind of really realized this, but you know, there can be hundreds of them going on simultaneously. Um, and it's again, very inefficient and not particularly effective. Too much money spent on television and too much of it too late. Canvassing, which I, I mean, it's, it, it's our field is our major um, comparative advantage, or at least one of them. And we don't nearly do nearly as a good a job of it as we could. I'll talk about that more later. <clears throat> and then something that is often raised, which is our weak messaging. Some of it is that we just don't have the platform, the propaganda platform that the Republicans have and Julie later is gonna be talking about a little bit of an antidote to that, but also the way I think we go about messaging, uh, which I think is not only not coordinated well, but not targeted as well as it should be, too complicated and actually too nice. So basically, 
my priority is yes, we want to support campaigns, but the extent that we can in a leveraged way, what we really want to do is address uh, when there's an opportunity to try to deal with these kind of systemic issues. Otherwise, we're just spinning our wheels uh, to some extent, and hundreds of millions of dollars get spent in ways that are not all that strategic. I'll come back to that. Okay, so turning to Virginia, just to recall, this was our strategy supporting three aspects of the House of Delegates, um, initial early challenger support, canvassing, and digital support. The idea was that it was gonna power up the sta statewide races, which of course we lost. And um, I do think that we helped, but obviously not enough. And I would use that balloon analogy uh, uh, to sort of make the case here. Um, but let's talk about a lot of the process stuff we actually did surprisingly well. So for example, for our digital efforts, uh, I think I'm hoping everybody knows what digital is, um, outreach via you know, computers and mobile and streaming uh, with videos and so forth. We actually raised uh, almost $280,000, much more than we anticipated. And that was, that was deployed uh, right up to the last uh, day. And our candidate support, our goal was 100,000. We raised 136,000. Um, kind of couldn't really turn that off. People kept, kept donating and that was you know, oh, good. Um, and then um, a little bit of more quantification of our digital and canvassing efforts. Um, this is our, tar I, I put the word targeted next to our digital. Uh, <clears throat> actually 9.3 million, that's right, million, not billion or trillion, but million video impressions, which means you know it, it was sent to somebody basically, and 6.5 million full views. Now I still can't get my arms around that. I still don't really have a sense of what that actually means in terms of impact, but, uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, that's actually uh, 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 quite good. And um, part, I think particularly because we targeted it well, I think it had you know, a significant impact. Oops, wait a minute. Shoot. Also, um, in terms of canvassing, um, our objective was, you know, we said gave ourselves a reach objective of 10,000 doors. Well, we actually did over 11,000 doors. And notice that um, most of the support actually went to incumbents. And, and that was, our, again, our deliberate strategy. Same thing with the digital. Um, it, once we sort of had done the initial funding for the uh, challengers, uh, the emphasis really was on trying to uh, support these vulnerable in incumbents. So, and here's more of that. This is from our website. And you can look at it in some detail uh, at your leisure. This is the usual way I do these spreadsheets and got the districts, name of the candidates. I wasn't able really to quantify very precisely the actual amount of dollars that went to candidates, but you can see in terms of digital, but um, you know, the, 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 the incumbents that were really on the line, that's where we did, you know, the, the largest amount of um, uh, support. But there, I mean, there's no sugar coating it. Uh, of the seven, these are all 17 people that we su supported in one way or another, a few of them very little. Um, of those 17, only five won, and only three uh, of the incumbents, and we'll talk to them some more uh, about them more later, um, actually uh, won. Um, and, uh, you know, the two uh, challenger, Sponsler and Gardner, that we invested in the most, um, you know, that was, uh, you know, again, maybe just the way the wind was blowing because the, uh, the polling that we heard on both of them was that in, in October, uh, they were even with their opponents and they were, they were moving in the right direction. So um, anyway, I, I don't actually think that our, I would necessarily change our strategy a lot. Um, uh, but I'd be open to ideas if people have other thoughts about how we might have done better. Obviously, it didn't turn out 
the way we wanted it to. Um, but here's one of the key findings, which is can, candidate funding overall was much more than ample. So again, of the 17 candidates that we supported one way or another, they spent through October 25th over $1.1 million. And that was you know, over twice as much or roughly twice as much as their opponents. Huge amount of money for a House of Delegates campaign. And looking at specific candidates, Wendy Goditis was at the top of the list of ours, 2.5 million versus 1.4 million. Nancy Guy, over 2 million, almost four times as much as her opponent. Alex Askew, 1.8 million, over twice what his opponent, even though they lost. Um, Josh Cole, I'm gonna go down the list, twice as much as his opponent, 1.6 million. I think that's the last one. Uh, much of that money came late, uh, especially from the party. And I mean, there was a lot of money earlier too, but it was spent on TV. And again, confirms my belief that this late money on TV is just not very effective, hard to tell. Now, there were a few bright spots, as you probably pretty much know. Wendy Goditis won. She won by only 821 votes. And she got, you know, she got 4,000 doors from us <laughs> and a, lot, a fair amount of digital support. Rodney Willett, you may remember we showed a video about him at the last meeting. He won, you know, by a decent amount, 1,700 votes in the end. Um, Kelly Fowler, <clears throat> only 300 votes fair amount of digital support. The other bright spot was just, we sort of adopted Stafford County in a way because we did a lot of canvassing for Josh Cole. And then we uh, did this poll greeting uh, and you know, pretty much cover a couple of the um, higher African-American districts and really helped out the Democratic Party. Thanks to all of you who helped with that. And it turned out that we ended up getting uh, Democratic and independent combined, two of, the, two of the people elected were independents, got uh, supervisor control of that county, which has probably uh, not been the truth since, you know, maybe about 2000 or so, I'm guessing. And also a positive uh, school board race. So that was because of our canvassing for Josh Cole, but also I'm convinced because this poll greeting stuff, if you do it right and you need to be aggressive, <laughs> Uh, I really think helps the down ballot uh, uh, races. And, but here are the, 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 the heartbreakers, if you will. Nancy Guy losing by uh, 600 and plus. Josh, by again, 600. Josh Cole, 600 and some. Alex Askew, a little over 100. Martha Mugler, oops. And uh, with by 94. And those last two, they're gonna have a recount because it's, I guess, less than a half a percent um, uh, difference. Uh, I think it's not likely that, unfortunately, that we're gonna win. Though it would be great uh, if we did win or one or both of those. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift a bit to just to canvassing and wanna show this canvassing picture I've showed before. I purposely picked this one from Stafford County, not only because we've got some of the, you, you who are on the call on this picture, but also notice that uh, Pam Young joined us for that. Uh, and she was one of the supervisor candidates who won. She actually was, I believe, a Democrat. I don't think an independent um, that helped tip the balance of power. And we did canvas uh, in her districts as well. That's her in the plum t-shirt. Okay. Now, so again, transitioning to um, more, a little bit more on canvassing, some of you may know that I pushed from the very beginning that we needed to try to reach out to low supported but low propensity voters. And it was hard. This is one of the problems with uh, the way the Democrats run their canvassing is they, in my view, perversely cut off the very voters that are the most likely to support them to change at the margin. And the, the, these, these are these folks. And I'll draw on my own experience because um, I knocked almost 
1,600 doors. I think I probably talked to 400 plus voters. And by kind of working hard at it, I was able to reach several dozen, I would say, low, low propensity voters. And I'm totally convinced that the large majority of, uh, of those that, I mean, I should say I, I reached about uh, several dozen that I think I convinced to vote that would not have otherwise to have done that. The interesting thing is that the kind of messaging that I feel like worked really well was very crude, very basic. You know, things like talking about crazy Republicans trying to ruin our country. Trump uh, is gonna steal our country. Now, the conventional wisdom is that message didn't work statewide and that may well be true. But the fact is with these voters, I can tell you that it did, did work. Another reason why uh, this sort of micro-targeting concept I think is really important in terms of communication. Um, the super rich message worked, even with Republicans too, by the way, some of them. Uh, and then talk, again, there are a couple of things about why state government is important for their lives. Uh, the elections won by only a few hundred votes. And, um, oops. Anyway, there are, there are specific messaging that I think work with those voters. And I think, you know, we need to uh, kind of press the point that, uh, you know, with whoever listen, that uh, we're not going after this a very important group of voters that are really uh, uh, often working class um, and, and um, uh, we're, being, are, we're, not, we're not reaching out to them. This comparative advantage that we have a field. Okay, now I'm gonna show a couple of the final digital pieces of work. Again, one is just a 15 minute, actually get out the vote ad. And it's, you know, it's very hard, fairly hard hitting. And it's again, it was, it was tar but targeted toward these uh, relatively low propensity voters. So only 15 seconds. COVID-19 numbers are surging, a 700% increase in positive cases. See younger and sicker patients. That's radical Republican control. Don't let it be Virginia. Protect yourself. Vote. COVID-19. Okay, so that uh, uh, was one example. And then at the very end, we had money and we were doing banner ads. COVID-19. So... You know, banner ads are just the kind of thing that just, there's, not, there's no video. But again, we, we targeted them. And again, this is done, done with um, Chris Bachman and Our States Matter to give, give them the credit. Um, this kind of a message uh, that, you know, trying to draw on their dislike for Trump. And, um, um, you know, I think this is uh, in the right direction of the kind of things that we should be doing for that kind of voter not necessarily for other voters. Okay, so again, some of the lessons learned and I, I've written saying always conditional. Um, I think we mobilize really effectively, both money and with the sort of hands-on physical stuff. It showed that we can do that. You know, we can, get, we can engage. Um, again, the same point about money limitations. Um, we did something for the, for the canvassing, um, which is a pre-canvas Zoom, and I'm calling it a check-in, uh, that I think actually worked pretty well. I think we've gotten the feedback. I think we do it better. And I think going forward, all the training efforts need to be better, but I think that was something positive. Um, again, support, you know, getting, reaching these low propensity voters works in my opinion. Digital, I think, appears to be highly effective. Um, again, uh, obviously didn't make the difference, but uh, it made, I'm, my, I'm convinced it made some difference. The election day greeting uh, helps the down ballot candidates. Uh, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna dwell on this. I mean, when it comes to messaging, you've seen a lot of things in the, in the newspaper and elsewhere about uh, messaging. You know, we should have done this, we should have done that. And um, I, I don't think there's any one answer to the messaging, but I'm convinced that intensity is extremely important. Having talked to a lot of voters and seen other kinds of research, 
most voters don't think about 12 different issues and do some kind of math in their head about what's most important to them. The ones that are trying to make some, some kind of decision, you know that for the most part, I'm convinced they might only, only focus on just one thing. And I think our part of our problem is we haven't sort of realized that. That's my view. Okay. So a little bit more forward looking, building on that. Um, first of all, even though the election results were bad in Virginia and New Jersey, um, they were actually not so bad or pretty good in three other states, um, span states, by the way. And I think Martha's gonna talk a little bit about this. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, somewhat missed, mixed, definitely some positives. Uh, some of these down ballot kind of things. Georgia, definitely mayoral races. Michigan, uh, I think definitely as well. So coming back to my issues, just to remind you, um, I got where we want to go. I mean, I, to me, yes, we're going to want to do some candidate work, but trying to find ways to address these systemic problems, realizing we can only do so much on our own, to me is, is you know, the most strategic thing to try to do. So some of the priorities, trying to support grassroots groups who would do that, state parties, uh, like span, the SPAN effort, voter registration, deep canvassing, which I hope maybe people don't know that much about that. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll return to that as something we can actually potentially do in the sort of winter time and springtime, maybe more springtime. Engage more on messaging uh, and some selective candidate support, especially early on, but very selective. And I think mostly down ballot kinds of things in my view. And then advocacy. I mean, I'm trying to make some of these points and everybody I can talk to. And um, I'm hoping that other groups will kind of pick up some of these points. Because a lot of people think that, you know, supporting uh, elections is really just about kind of getting attached to an, a particular candidate or a set of candidates, sending them money, and then waiting to see if they win or not. And I just think there's better ways in general to spend money. By now you've heard me make that point. Okay, now switching to messaging, um, I like to think of it as kind of a, way, a, a form of three-dimensional chess in a way that, um, and this, I think the Republicans have done a better job of, of subdividing uh, uh, the market segmentation, if you will. And um, really, there are all these things. It's the right audience. I think you want to do some broad, but also what I call micro-targeting with the right timing in the election cycle, with the right content, the right tactical format, and the right media combinations to reach people. Um, and then this again, I think it, we are very much guilty, even though it's true, we don't get credit for all the good stuff we do. Um, that's true, and we can do better at that, but also we need to be a little more unnice, if you will, or maybe a lot more unnice. And uh, this point I was making before about intensity. Notice I didn't say stupid, I just I try to be nice, say smart. Okay. Now here are the Republican high intensity issues, some of them, there are more of them. So I'm just gonna go down the, the list. This, this is, you know, we've heard about education and critical race theory, but also anti-vax and mass mandate guns. Uh, they've been doing the welfare chiseler thing for decades, LGBT phobia. The thing is that pretty much all of these things are things where the majority of people of voters are against them. But there are some people that are so concerned about abortion or so worried about their guns or so worried about you know, socialism or criminals. And I talked to voters who you know, were up in arms about the vax, vaccine mandate. Um, one other little point is that, um, maybe it's not that little, but the Republicans actually target recent immigrants uh, Ron Rappaport was telling me, for example, uh, with respect to um, Ethiopian immigrants about what's going on <laughs> now in Ethiopia. And we know that uh, the, 
Uh, Trump campaign did that with Venezuelan immigrants in Florida uh, to use that again. But we can do that too. Now we have a, a set of high intensity issues as well, um, like the greedy super rich, which I think is very broad approach. But many of these other things, in my view, have to be targeted very carefully. But I think we have the tools to do that. I just think that, you know, we don't have intent tended to do that. Anyway, my view on messaging. Now, um, this takes us to SPAN and talking about our priority states. I've listed the SPAN states here um, and Martha's gonna talk to us some more about it. Notice that I bolded Pennsylvania and look, I, I bolded, what? Michigan. Now what's going on there? Well. Um, Michigan has not been on our radar scope, but um, um, you know, I was sort of, for my own personal donating, I was thinking, uh, you know, it, 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 having a conversation with actually Ron Rappaport, uh, my college roommate, who I think is on the, on the Zoom, it's actually more important to be spending money now in some ways or, or giving money now than later on. So I decided, well, I'm, I'm gonna to try to make some contributions to some of these span um, states. And uh, talking to Martha, she said, well, by far Michigan is the highest priority. Now we know they don't have a Senate race, but they have a very important governor's race. If we lose that governor's race, we're in the soup to put it nicely. And they have a couple of our very important con Congress people like Alyssa Slotkin and so forth state legislature. So, um, and it looks like there's a lot of need and opportunity there. So it kind of is a side project. Uh, Mary and I, maybe a few others are gonna try to raise uh, some money specifically for Michigan. We're not gonna put it on the front agenda for 31st Street uh, yet, or maybe at all, uh, probably at all. But, you know, if people are interested in, um, in getting involved in, in this particular uh, undertaking, by all means, reach out to Mary or me. Uh, 